Ergothionine extends lifespan. So let's have a look at that data. So here we have survival plotted on the y-axis against days elapsed or lifespan on the x. And this is data in fruit flies, more specifically the Canton S strain. So when looking at 50% survival, this is the time when half of the fruit fly colony has died and half is still alive. We can assess median lifespan. So when compared with the control diet, CK, in dark blue, there was an extension of lifespan for intermediate doses of ergothionine from 10 micromolar to 100 micromolar and 1 millimolar with median lifespan increases of 11 to 15%. Also, relatively smaller uh, doses of ergothionine, included, including 100 nanomolar, and relatively higher doses of ergothionine, 10 millimolar, significantly increased lifespan, 1 and 2%. Now, note that this is the first study to evaluate the impact of ergothionine in lifespan. Uh, there are no studies in mammals yet, so I thought that this was an interesting study to cover. All right, what about uh, lifespan in male flies? So again, this is the Canton S uh, strain of fruit fly. And again, we're looking at survival. So when looking at 50% survival, and when compared with the uh, lifespan of the control diet, CK, ergothionine supplemented flies that had one millimolar and 100 micromolar of ergothionine in their, in their diet lived 9% and 12% longer uh, for a median lifespan when compared with the control diet. But interestingly, there was also a decrease in lifespan for a relatively lower intake of ergothionine, one micromolar, so a 6% decreased lifespan when compared with the control diet. Now, note that so we've got a lifespan extension, but now we also have lifespan shortening. So uh, interestingly, the authors of the study decided to look at ergothionine's potential effect on lifespan in a different uh, fl fruit fly strain, the y YW strain, and that's what we can see here. So did ergothionine affect lifespan in a separate uh, fly strain? So in other words, a different genetic background when compared with the Canton S strain. So again, we're looking at the YW strain for fruit flies, and we're looking at the 50% survival when compared with the control diet in dark purple, CK. We can see now, again, there's a significant increase in lifespan for the intermediate doses of ergothionine, 1 millimolar and 100 micromolar. But also, again, we have a significant decrease in lifespan, too, for relatively lower 100 nanomolar and relatively higher 10 millimolar for ergothionine. So again, we've got this lifespan extension, but also lifespan shortening. So what about in the male uh, YW strain of fruit flies? So again, going right to 50% survival when compared with the control diet, dark purple or dark blue CK. Again, we have that increased lifespan for the intermediate doses of ergothionine, 100 micromolar and 10 micromolar, so 7 and 6% increase in median lifespan. But again, we have a small but significant decrease in median lifespan for, the rel for a, a relatively higher dose of ergothionine, 10 millimolar. And actually, if you look at the light blue and brown, uh, there are two curves to the left, meaning there, uh, there's a decreased lifespan, decreased median lifespan for the lowest doses, one micromolar and 100 nanomolar, but these weren't statistically significant. So uh, from this data, we can see that both relatively lower and higher amounts of ergothionine reduce lifespan. But what also happened in this study is that consistently 100 micromolar, as I've put in this green rectangle, for each of the fly strains, Canton S and the YW, and in both male and female flies, 100 micromolar of ergothionine significantly extended lifespan in, in both fly strains and in both genders. So the big question is, how is it doing that? So is it a mild calorie restriction, CR? So to assess that, the authors of this study looked at uh, food intake, which is what's on the y-axis, and then they uh, looked at flies at two different ages, so 10-day-old flies and 30-day-old flies. And note that the maximum lifespan for the flies in this study was somewhere around 110 days, so these are still uh, very young flies. And then they recorded food intake after one hour of feeding and 48 hours of feeding. So in the very young flies at 10 days old, we can see that there was no difference when comparing the control diet with the ergothionine supplemented flies uh, so young, young flies had no difference in food intake, whether feeding for an hour or for 48 hours. And similarly, there was no difference in food intake for the flies that were a little bit older, 30 days old, whether feeding for an hour or feeding for 48 hours. So from this, we can conclude there was no difference in food intake, and that kind of rules out, that rules out that calorie restriction is not responsible for ergothionine's lifespan extending effect. And note that this study that they did for the feeding was uh, with ergothionine at 100 micromolar in, in their food. So 
Uh, that's the dose that was shown to extend lifespan in both fly strains and in both male and female flies. So uh, for all the experiments, uh, the data that I'm going to show, it was at that 100 micromolar uh, dose that extended lifespan for basically all of uh, the fly data that I just showed. All right, so what about the gut microbiome? So to assess whether the gut microbiome was involved in the lifespan extending effect of ergothionine, they treated the flies, both the control CK and ergothionine supplemented with antibiotics. So azenic flies means that the flies are treated with antibiotics in order to uh, deplete the gut microbiome. And what we can see by looking at 50% survival is that uh, there was no increase in either median or even in the maximal, even though I didn't put an arrow there, uh, in terms of comparing the ergothionine antibiotic treated versus the control diet antibiotic treat, uh, treatment. So that suggests that because the uh, lifespan data is the same for the ergothionine now versus the controls when treated both with antibiotics, that suggests that the gut microbiome is responsible for this, for this uh, lifespan extending effect of ergothionine because the lifespan extending effect goes away when the flies are treated with antibiotics. Now, the authors of the study didn't go further into how that may be uh, the case, uh, so I'm looking forward to future studies that can uh, help tease that data out. How is the microbiome uh, affecting ergothionine's effects on lifespan, at least in flies? So what they did find is that there was also there was reduced oxidative stress. So in addition to the uh, effect of the gut microbiome on lifespan, ergothionine supplemented flies had reduced oxidative stress. So how did they measure oxidative stress? Well, they used the GSH to GSSG ratio, GSH being glutathione, GSSG being um, glutathione disulfide, which is uh, basically oxidized to uh, two, uh, two molecules of glutathione get oxidized and they basically stick together to form one molecule of GSSG. So that ratio, the GSG, GSH to GSSG ratio, is a measure of oxidative stress. So why is it a measure of oxidative stress? So here we can see that starting with GSH, glutathione, in the presence of a mild oxidant, in this case a hydrogen peroxide, H2O2, glutathione becomes oxidized, thereby, thereby forming a GSSG. So we can see that in very young flies that were 10 days old, there was no difference in the GSH to GSSG ratio uh, for the very young flies. But then it, uh, for 30-day-old flies, we can see first that uh, the GSH-GSSG ratio is dramatically reduced when compared with the very young flies uh, for both the uh, control diet and the ergothionine supplemented in blue. But then the ergothionine supplemented had less oxidative stress as indicated by this ratio when compared with the flies that were on the control, control diet. So how is this happening? Why is the GSH to GSSG ratio increased in ergothionine supplemented flies? And one reason is because the flies that were fed ergothionine had increased antioxidant levels, which is what we can see here. So first we're looking at uh, sod and cat. So what, what is that? So uh, in the presence of superoxide, which is uh, delineated there, superoxide dismutase converts it. Uh, well, the enzyme superoxide dismutase, otherwise known as SOD, converts that superoxide into the less toxic hydrogen peroxide, and then catalase can degrade that hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen. So uh, sod and cat are very important for antioxidant defense, especially against superoxide radicals and hydrogen peroxide. So first, looking at the data in the very young flies that were 10 days old, we can see that there was no difference in sod or cat, so no difference in these antioxidant enzymes at very young ages. But then for both the 30-day-old and the 50-day-old flies, uh, we can see significant increases for both sod and cat in the ergothionine-fed flies when compared with the control diet. So we've got increased antioxidant levels that may ex explain this uh, improvement in the GSH-GSSG ratio that in the ergothionine supplemented flies when compared with controls. All right, so which foods are rich in ergothionine as a means for getting this into our diet? Where can we get it from, from food? And I, I already have a, an ergothionine video. If you missed that, I'll put that in the right corner. So I've covered some of this before, but uh, let's just go through it. So here we're looking at ergothionine content in milligrams of ergothionine per kilogram of food in dry weight, DW. So oats, kidney beans, and oprin have very small amounts of ergothionine, and then we can see higher amounts for garlic, chicken liver, Mexican asparagus, and then the soy product tempeh. But far and above the all-star for ergothionine content is mushrooms. As we can see, white button mushrooms and great oyster mushrooms have far more ergothionine content when compared with the, all, all the other foods on this list. So mushrooms are a concentrated source of ergothionine, but then also note that they also contain spermidine, which has also been shown to extend lifespan. And I'm not a fan of the term superfoods, uh, but 
con when considering that mushrooms have both ergothionine and spermidine uh, metabolites now that are both shown to increase, increase lifespan, you know, I'd be tempted to call it a superfood. Now note that for my most recent blood test for the 42-day period that uh, went from my blood test number five to blood test number six, that 42-day period, I averaged 166 and a half grams of mushrooms, mushrooms per day. Now, when considering that ergothionine can increase but also decrease lifespan, is my mushroom intake too much, just right, or not enough? So by tracking food intake and blood biomarkers, in other words, the big picture biomarkers that I presented in many recent videos, uh, uh, by looking at correlations between that, between food intake, in this case mushrooms, with the big picture biomarkers, that can help identify the mushroom dose that may be optimal for health and potentially longevity. We won't know longevity because we'd have to live out you know, the remainders of our lives. Uh, so now I, do, I only have one dietary period that corresponds to one blood test, so I'll need many more blood tests with tracked dietary data in order to start, look, start looking at correlations for mushroom intake on the big picture biomarkers, but I fully intend to make a video on that at some point in the uh, upcoming future. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoy the video. Have a great day.